Welcome viewers, my name is Commissioner Palmer. Uh, welcome to another EAC Zoom interview with the nation's chief election officials. Uh, speaking on the use of CARES Act election grants during the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that's having on our election, primary and general election. These funds are uh, $400 million in supplemental funding in addition to the 425 million in security funding early appropriated uh, in 2020. Commissioner McCormick and I are pleased to have with us two secretaries of states Cara Ardoin of Louisiana and Denise Merrill of Connecticut, two of the most engaging and active members of the uh, election community. But before we get started, I'd like to tell, uh, take a moment and tell the listening audience about, about them in more specifics. First, uh, Kyle Ardoin is Louisiana's 44th Secretary of State. He's a resident of Baton Rouge and he was elected on December 8, 2018 after serving as acting Secretary of State since May of 2018 was recently re-elected to a full term in December of 19 and brings a wealth of knowledge to the office with nearly a decade of prior service as first assistant secretary of state. Secretary Ardoin's goals include securing new voting equipment for the entire state of Louisiana, maintaining the department's cybersecurity posture and protecting sensitive voter data while also continuing the agency's high-tech protections for both elections and commercial divisions. Denise Merrill was elected to her third term as Connecticut's 73rd Secretary of State on November 6, 2018. And as Connecticut's Chief Election Official and Business Registrar, Merrill has focused on modernizing Connecticut's elections, business services, and improving access to public records. Since taking office, she has supported and expanded democratic participation, ensuring that every citizen's rights and privileges are protected and that every vote is counted accurately. She has served as President of the National Association of Secretaries of State, NAS, for the 2016 and 17 term and was a co-chair of NAS's Election Infrastructure Subsector Government Coordinating Council. She also serves on the Board of Advisors to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission and we're very thankful for that. <laughs> Thank you for both joining us. Uh, now on to the issues of COVID-19 and the use of CARES Act election funding. Um, I've done a lot of talking so I'm going to hand it over to Commissioner McCormick, and so you can start the questions, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Arduin and Secretary Merrill, for joining us today. I want to start with Secretary Merrill with this first question. Um, how did you and your staff members begin planning for your response to the coronavirus pandemic? Well, thanks, and thank you for having me today. Um, I think Connecticut was one of the first states uh, that was hit with a large number of people contracting the, the virus. Uh, mostly it came up from New York and still is largely focused in Fairfield County, which is the southernmost county in the state. Um, and so early on, fairly early on, our governor did an emergency order uh, ordering people to stay in their homes where possible, all the things that we all now know about. But at the time, um, we had our primary coming up uh, April 28th. Uh, so uh, the first thing we did, honestly, was to con uh, con contact our local clerks and registrars uh, because we knew this was going to be a big thing. And of course, our, ma our uh, elections are totally managed at the local level. We have no counties in Connecticut. It's a kind of an unusual situation, more typical of New England, I think, but we have 169 small towns mostly and two registrars, one from each party and a town clerk that all are involved at the local level one way or another. So we knew uh, that we had to, first of all, communicate them what we were, what we were hearing from DHS, from CDC, and other uh, organizations about how we were gonna manage that primary. Since that time, we have um, actually uh, postponed the primary twice now. We now have our primary August 11th, which must be the latest one in the, in the country but because of our very strict laws about uh, once we had uh, established who was going to be on the ballot, we couldn't really remove them even if they uh, suspended their campaigns. Uh, without a written consent. So, so here we are. Uh, we uh, got tried to get the support of the local people. And I have to tell you, that was a challenge. There was a lot of fear out there, you know, especially among the town clerks who have to manage absentee ballots. We also are one of the strictest states about absentee ballots. Only about five to eight percent of people 
use absentee ballots in a typical election in Connecticut. And our absentee ballot restrictions are in our state constitution, um, which means they can't be overridden even by the governor. So that's where we found ourselves. Uh, like I say, we did um, move the primary since that time, and we've been working ever since um, hard at work on getting a plan together. And I'm certainly glad we have the extra time. So maybe Great. I'll well, uh, there. <laughs> Secretary Arduin, I know Louisiana is structured very differently from Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> what are you and your staff members doing? Uh, to plan your response to the coronavirus pandemic? Well, the first uh, case that was uh, confirmed in the state of Louisiana was on March 9th, which was the opening day of our legislative session in which the governor announced our first case. Um, we had our uh, elections, our presidential preference primary scheduled for April 4th, um, and then uh, local elections on May 9th. Um, we were the first state in the nation, if I recall correctly, uh, to uh, delay our elections. Uh, we moved them then to a June and July date. Uh, and then we further moved them recently um, to July 11th and August 15th, uh, which is, I think, is the absolute la latest dates we too can, can hold um, elections. In fact, the Republican um, Party had to get a waiver from the uh, RNC in order for them to uh, allocate their delegates because um, our election on July 11th is two days after their deadline. Um, we were concerned with the availability of um, our commissioners. So more than half of our commissioners are over the age of 65. Um, so we were very concerned with whether or not we could perform a safe election um, while the pandemic was going on. Um, I think we, in hindsight, we made the best decisions of prolonging our elections um, because we're now starting to see a decline in the number of cases statewide. Um, we worked with our locals um, and we were hearing from them, uh, whether they were the clerks or the registrars that they, they feared most not having the support they needed to run the elections. Um, we, we began trying to figure out how could we deliver an election and we realized that probably the best way is uh, through our emergency um, pr provisions that were be um, developed after the Katrina uh, where mm -hmm. it gave me authority to declare an emergency um, and then the governor could agree and certify that um, and allowed us to move the dates but a second phase of that is um, that we were able to I was able to certify an emergency the governor agreed and then the two committees with jurisdiction in the legislature had to agree as well and then they once they agreed they asked me for a plan to put forth and what we did was we were we looked back on our experience in Katrina and we developed what we think um, was the most appropriate response which was an expanded absentee program um, we created a, a COVID-19 uh, absentee uh, request form um, that is now in use at this time. Um, we had to deal with a lot of fear, uh, as as did uh, Secretary Merrill referred to, uh, not just from our local election officials, but also from the public uh, in general. Uh, much like uh, Secretary Merrill, we only had the highest amount of absentee ballots we've ever experienced was 3.7% um, of total votes cast. Um, so there was a lot of fear of fraudulent activity or the potential for fraudulent activity. And so that got mired with the federal talk of vote by mail. Um, I, everything you could dream of came down on us all at once. And it was probably the most stressful situation I've ever dealt with in terms of trying to put together a plan. But we did, the legislature approved it. It was a strong bipartisan approach and strong bipartisan um, participation, but uh, um, it, it just was probably the weirdest thing I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, but we well, got you two, you, both of your states are hot spots, but um, you know, one of the things you both raise in your answers to that question is the importance of uh, what to do in an emergency and what what your states will allow uh, through your constitution or through through your governmental powers, your legislative powers. So that's something that. I think we'll all take away from this situation is reviewing uh, what we can do in times like these uh, going forward. Um, because a lot of places are very limited uh, in what you can do. So, um, Commissioner Palmer, you want to take the next question? Sure. Uh, it's fascinating discussion. 
uh, from Secretary Ardoin. Um, so you guys have had a chance, uh, both the secretaries have had a chance to talk with your locals and have a plan. What did you assess their greatest needs to be or will need to be for the primary and, and perhaps the general? Um, and you did t discuss their concerns. Um, what do you think their biggest needs will be um, in responding to COVID-19? Well, I think the biggest need is personal protective equipment um, that we have been working on. Uh, actually, we were the first state agency um, to be able to access enough uh, raw materials, if you will, to be able to make our own hand sanitizer. Um, and it actually, because we put off our elections, I think we've gotten 16 55 gallon drums of isopropyl alcohol. Uh, and then we were in the process of obtaining the mixtures necessary and we were going to mix our own. It was really going to be pretty interesting to see my employees with a gallon or multiple gallon um, buckets and, and mixing um, hand sanitizer. But uh, uh, we were spared that. Our correctional facilities took that over. Uh, we donated that 50, those 55 gallon drums, those 16 of them, to the state for healthcare workers and others. Um, the other thing was, you know, the, um, our locals were very um, concerned about whether or not we would be able to ascertain enough elections commissioners. And I think we saw the issues that were presented in, um, in Wisconsin with regards to that. And uh, I talked to my colleague in Florida and they had some challenges as well. I mean, I think Secretary Merrill will agree with me. You just can't shut down precincts uh, overnight and, and be able to operate larger precincts with fewer people. Um, that's just not possible. Um, not without getting in a whole lot of trouble and a lot of voter confusion um, and creating obstacles for people to participate to vote. So we felt like working with our, our partners in and at really um, early voting was of concern to our local partners, the registrars, because they run early voting. Um, they, in the early days, they were concerned whether or not they would be um, exposing themselves uh, unnecessarily uh, if we didn't expand uh, absentee balloting. Um, so we worked through every, all those concerns and the closer we got to the new dates, we realized we just weren't prepared enough uh, and we were going to be competing with healthcare workers for the very materials we needed to provide a safe environment for elections. Uh, and I didn't want to be that person uh, to have to compete with them. So I asked the governor to delay the election further and we both agreed to do so and that's when we developed the plan. I had a probably not probably. I had four different plans that we we uh, generated, um, and then recommended one to the governor, and he did not even blink an eye. He said, "Mr. Secretary, if that's what you think is necessary, then that's what we're going to do." And I think that's the important thing is that what people don't realize is that in times of of um, uh, epidemic or pandemics or, or or emergencies, you know, elected officials have to pull together to find a way to work together, regardless of ideology or where we are in the political spectrum. Um, but the one thing is that a lot of the voters did not grasp that because um, we had a portion, a large portion of the state that was not as uh, highly affected uh, by the pandemic. And we had portions of the state that were extremely affected um, and there was no in between. Um, so you had a portion of the state thinking we were, we were given in to the fraud aspect of potential fraud of elections. And then we had those who were saying, you're, gonna, you're asking me to kill myself by going out and voting. There was no win, win for any of us. Uh, but that's the cost of leadership. But uh, I felt uh, having the support of my attorney general and the, um, the legislative leaders and the governor really brought it all together. And we were able to uh, work bipartisanly to, to solve this issue. And I think over time, the fears are going to work themselves out. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Merrill, um, how about you in, in your counties? Um, what has been, what do you think the biggest need will be? But also touching on what Secretary Ardoin talked about was not just the fear, maybe potentially of poll workers, but also voters and how they see this. How do you see them being accommodating for different types of voting? Well, nothing has ever generated more mail and concern than this situation. Mostly in my state, it's people fearing to go to the polls because they don't want to jeopardize their health. I mean, here we are pretty affected across the state and people are taking it very, very seriously. So we just have to deal with that. And we are expecting 
a large number of additional absentee ballot requests because we do have a provision in our statutes that said you can request it um, if you are unable to get to the polls due to illness. So we've been busy, you know, with all the lawyers uh, in the governor's office and my office trying to figure out what that means because it has never been tested before. There's no law on the subject. What does it mean, illness? And so um, we, we have come out with an opinion. I think it is gonna mean more people will vote absentee because I see the great concern. Uh, however, our job and everything uh, Secretary Arduin is saying sounds very familiar. Our job is to figure out human behavior here because you both have to have, you know, there are multiple problems with safe polling places. And then there's multiple problems with trying to process a huge number of new absentee ballots. We're just not set up for it. And so uh, we could never manage the situation, I have to say right now, without the federal dollars that are coming our way. And those two things are exactly why, how we're using them. This, we, are, we are requiring every town to have what we call a safe polling plan. And they can tell us if they need, I think the biggest need is gonna be poll workers. Just as you said, Kyle, you call them something different in Louisiana, but basically most of the people working at our polls are over the age of 65. And many of them have already indicated they have no intention of working this year. And so we just have to recruit an entire new generation of poll workers. And frankly, we've known this has been coming for many years. I, I've gone to workshops at NASA about this issue. And, you know, it was never a crisis until now. So we are going to have a, um, a volunteer poll worker, not really volunteers, we're going to use some of the federal dollars to actually recruit poll workers at a state level uh, using the governor's own, un, there are plenty of people around here who are unemployed, students who are home from school, uh, and a huge volunteer database of people who want to serve in this time of need. So we're going to do something like that. We have a plan uh, that we're going to launch this week. Uh, and, and we're going to try to get the PPE for people. That's going to be a challenge. I mean, you're right, Kyle. I, I didn't want to compete with the healthcare workers for the masks. So I'm really thankful that the governor uh, saw fit to move our primary further out because it gives us a chance to obtain these things. And then we're looking at whether or not we should be moving some polling places, but we're gonna do it very carefully. I think Milwaukee was a real wake up call for everyone because everyone saw it on television and they realized I'm not standing in a line like that to vote. And in a sense, I, I sympathize with those people in Wisconsin. They thought everybody was going to vote absentee, and that didn't happen. So that just shows you the balance we're going to have to strike somehow between these two issues. And more absentee ballots, that's going to require some resources on our part. We are going to mail applications for absentee ballots. We have a very complicated absentee ballot process. It's a two-step process. You have to ask for one, then you get that in the mail, then you mail it back in a double envelope. It's very, very time consuming and um, has lots of checks and balances, shall we say. So I think we're not changing any of that because of the concern about fraud that always emerges when you change things in elections. Um, and so it's going to be a challenge for us to be able to manage a, a bigger volume that we're expecting. So, but that's what we're doing. We're, every town will have to have a safe polling plan, much like their emergency plans. I was co-chair of the committee at NASS that put in place that emergency plan recommendation uh, after, the, uh, after the hurricanes. And so um, we are, our towns already have those. Every town is required to have one. So we're just gonna build on that. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, Commissioner McCormick, uh, you wanna take the next question? Sure, uh, Secretary Merrill kind of uh, started answering this question already. So I'll go to uh, Secretary Arduin. Um, you know, as you know, it's not just about the planning, it's about the dollars as well. And we've got the $400 million from uh, the federal government. So how are you planning to use the CARES Act funding uh, to prepare for a potential increase in absentee and mail voting? And what changes are you planning to implement at early voting locations at election day polling locations and with your commissioners or poll workers with the CARES Act funding? Well, we're really thankful for the uh, CARES Act funding. Um, what we did uh, as an initial response is I sent out over 317,000 uh, letters 
to individuals who are 65 and older who uh, under current law can request an absentee ballot uh, automatically um, through our 65 and older program or just for a particular election. Um, we have seen a tremendous response from that uh, mailing. Uh, and so we will have um, a good number more of absentee ballots than we've ever had before for this election, which then I built into the emergency plan, the need uh, for additional scanning equipment. Um, the, the scanning machines we have now can only take, uh, I think the speed is about 25 to 30 sheets per minute. Um, this one will get us above 60, uh, which is really important when you have multiple um, pages of, of ballots. Um, and, you know, the presidential, I mean, God help us, if there was ever a time not to have a pandemic, this was one. With the presidential election, much like Secretary Merrill was saying um, earlier, we're unable to take anyone off the ballot, whether they've suspended their campaign or not. So it's a lengthy ballot uh, with the Democrats and the Republicans. And at the same time, we have the party elections uh, for their state central committees and their uh, local uh, parish uh, for you all counties. Um, uh, offices. And so that combined with judicial elections and others, uh, we have a pretty lengthy ballot, um, but not as lengthy as November is going to bring. Uh, but uh, so what we've done is we're, we're utilizing it for either leasing or purchasing. We haven't made that final decision yet of new scanning equipment. Um, I'm going to have to uh, obviously use the money for uh, personal protective equipment for our polling commissioners um, and uh, our support personnel that are in the field. Um, we're going to uh, also um, uh, procure additional, uh, we've got to procure additional uh, paper supplies, which we have never had to do before um, because it's been so minimum. Um, and then we're also, we built into the plan, we have to move at least um, 32 polling locations, about 10% of our polling locations have to be moved because they are connected in some way to a senior uh, center, uh, a nursing home, or even a hospital. Um, so we're moving those polling locations away as we speak, uh, looking for new uh, facilities, or we're combining polling locations within which then creates even more issues um, with regards to that. So there's a lot of unforeseen, uh, as you can well um, understand, when you tip a domino, they all gonna fall. And so that's what happens in elections. When you tip one domino, it changes collectively throughout the whole process. And so we have to adjust to that. Additionally, in our emergency uh, plan, we expanded early voting for the first time in our history from seven days to 13 days. Um, our hope is that we can spread out our voters throughout those 13 days, um, giving them enough opportunity to vote without having to feel like they have to vote on election day um, in these smaller locations. Um, but that's got its own set of challenges because many of them are in courthouses um, around the state and those are facilities aren't very big. So that ch creates challenges for spatial, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, distancing, social distancing. Um, so we're, it, it is just the dominoes. And so we keep, we're playing dominoes with everybody and we're, we're attempting to deal what we can. Uh, we're working with our National Guard uh, to assist us during early voting with social distancing. Uh, I've got a challenge of dealing with courthouses who are doing temperature checks uh, on people who are entering their buildings. And I've got to inform them on early voting days, you cannot reject someone because they have a temperature. If they present themselves to vote, you have to let them vote. I mean, it is a whole host of issues that we never dreamed we would be dealing with, um, but that, you know, people were scared. So with all the changes comes a lot of unexpected costs. And um, I think one of the things that we're concerned with is actually even being able to meet the, the needs for the um, the match, the 20% match, uh, which I think equates to about 1.2 or $1.3 million for us. Um, but we do have different expenditures we've already reached that I think we'll be able to utilize in showing the, the federal government that we were meeting the, that match in some form or fashion. Um, but I certainly hope that Congress will recognize the fact that not only do we need money for this election cycle, we're gonna need it for the fall in order to, um, depending if there's a resurgence of this pandemic, well, we all are tipping dominoes in so many ways and in a short time frame too. I mean, this is all condensed 
down to, you know, six months, really. I mean, with these primaries, even less. Uh, so, you know, everybody's working around the clock trying to figure it out. Um, Secretary Merrill, do you want to add to uh, how you're planning on using the CARES Act for your potential increase in absentee or mail balloting or early voting locations? Uh, there's so much that goes into this. I, I can't imagine how we would do this without it, honestly. Uh, this is all so sudden, and we are going to have to hire a lot of temporary help uh, for the clerks to manage the ABs, for the uh, towns to get new poll workers, uh, all kinds of things, expenses that we never could have anticipated. So um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's great. We are using it partially to mail applications out because that hel helps the towns with the burden that they have to bear of all this activity. Um, but, you know, the, the public is so tuned into this. I've been kind of amazed, honestly, by the concern out there in the public for their right to vote. Mm -hmm. And um, it's generated just a lot of emotion uh, in my state. I don't know if that's true everywhere, but people are um, already sort of on edge, I think. and. This is uh, just making them frantic about their right to vote. And so that's why we are trying so hard and we are using the money to make sure people feel that their right to vote is not in jeopardy. It's, it feels like one of the big things we're gonna do that hasn't been talked about yet is we're gonna mount a very significant public information campaign. Because I think the biggest problem is people are so confused about what the rules are. Has anything changed? Can I get an absentee ballot? should I get an absentee ballot? Are the polling places going to be safe? So I think we're gonna to have to spend a significant amount of resource on trying to reach people with the answers to these questions. Do you think that the, I, with all this increase in absentee and mail voting, I think we're gonna see a big increase everywhere yes. uh, outside of the states that already do it full time, you know, for their complete elections. But do you think that the public's uh, patience is gonna last during the, the count of, uh, on election day, we're not, we probably aren't gonna have an, have an answer on election day. That uh, is a big concern. Arduin said, you know, 20 to 30 ballots per minute. It's a long time to tabulate these ballots. What are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I mean, we haven't even begun to tackle the idea that the governor, I, I suggested to the governor that we change the statute so that the expectation is not that we're gonna have everything counted within 24 hours. It's just not possible. We don't even have early voting. We have no days of early voting. So everything is gonna converge on that one day. We have yeah. such a lack of any flexibility in our statutes or in the state constitution, and that's gonna make it worse. So, you know, I mean, I think part of that public education campaign probably will be sort of deflating expectations from the yeah. public that, and the media for that matter, that we're gonna have instant results, we're not. Yeah, it's not no, gonna I be mean, a typical election night. No, that's for sure. <laughs> right. I, I can certainly say that the um, that was a major issue in our emergency plan. I had originally built um, two weeks post election day to provide results. And you would have thought that I created a, a um, just a, a another uh, pandemic. I mean, they just really people thought we were going to create an opportunity for elections to be stolen. Um, and what we couldn't get across to folks is that we need that time because we're not experienced enough, and and that all the concerns. Um, that I've been hearing, and I, I worked a lot with um, Secretary Wyman um, and consulted her a lot, uh, and and all the barriers that she was telling me um, with regards to being able to flip our system in a way, even even going from 3.7 percent to 10 percent, is going to be a significant um, barrier to overcome, uh, much less. Um, if we had to go to an all male system and she, you know, she was not advocating that at all for us because of where we were. But so I ended up having to go the opposite direction. So I told the, our, in our emergency plan, we built in the need for new equipment, but I also created the expectation of, I need our local boards to begin not tabulating, but to begin the preparation necessary for tabulation up to two days prior to election day. So all they could start processing um, and checking 
uh, paper ballots, the, the outside flaps, the signatures, the, everything that they normally do to make sure that ballot is appropriate and, and is ready to be counted to be done two days prior to the election. Um, so where we increased our number of meetings for our local boards, the number of personnel necessary uh, to perform the election. Um, so, and then we're going to have to start tabulation early on election day, much earlier than they're used to, which is going to spread my staff a lot thinner than normal um, because the expectation is there. If, if we aren't showing, beginning showing results at 8 p.m. Uh, when, and I try to remind everybody, the polls close at 8 p.m. There is no pipeline that I've stuffed election results in and then they we turn it on. It doesn't happen that way. Um, but that expectation is there because when you do your job efficiently and you and you, your staff is more and more efficient, the expectation becomes higher and higher. And unfortunately, what people aren't realizing is the more paper, the more work, the more, the more issues that we face. Because in any normal election, we're bound to, it's going to come down to the paper ballots as the issue that we have to deal with. Because if a scanner breaks or if there's a delay in the process, that, that creates issues um, and, and um, forces us to deal with issues that we have to deal with with the press and the public. Um, for example, we had a Senate race um, just this last cycle. It came down to literal election night. They thought, one candidate thought he won by nine votes. And my staff calls me at a quarter to midnight and says, guess what? It's actually a tie. And oh. I'm like, that's the worst nightmare ever. So yeah. I'm like, I called that candidate. I said, I don't want you to put your head on the, on the pillow thinking you've won. There's, a, <laughs> there's an issue and here's where we are. And, and uh, you know, I'll get you more information as we go. And I, Luckily, there were only three candidates in the race, and I was able to communicate with them and outline the process for recounts and everything. But it is a huge issue that we as election officials don't necessarily control, but everyone looks to us for the answers. And, you know, I feel for Denise, if she's, without early voting, um, I, you know, I would be very worried for my state um, because we, we, they expect the numbers very quickly. And with that negative reaction over two weeks after. And I didn't think it was going to take two weeks, but I didn't want to create a false expectation. I really thought it was only going to be, need a week. Um, and when they realize that other states don't get their results, when they have mail ballots for a week or two after the election, man, that's not a pretty sight. <laughs> that's right. Well, your well, story brings up the election officials prayer, which is we pray for wide margins, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Commissioner okay. Palmer. Well, yeah, there really is an expectation in a lot of states, particularly battleground states, that the results will be there at seven or eight whenever the polls close. And I think the media also has those expectations. And so um, I'm not sure how the political parties and the media back down from that election night experience. Um, we have our own issues to deal with, but it'd be amazing to see how it all comes together. Um, following up on you know sort of the obstacles uh, that we're facing for the upcoming elections, um, you know, you mentioned public education, and I think a lot of the fear is being aggravated by not really understanding what's going on and what their options will be. But also, you know, one of the things we've had lessons learned is the Postal Service, when there is a process where an absentee ballot request um, is going back and forth in the mail or the ballot in the mail, you know, there's some time that and expectations that voters may have that are not realistic. And so what do you think the biggest obstacle will be for your voters and for your election officials um, in the coming elections that you'll face? And how can the CARES Act dollars help? Well, I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of them. Um, you know, just the guesswork of trying to figure out how many absentee ballots are going to come in to a system like ours that can't really handle them easily. Uh, what role the Postal Service will play in that, because I too have talked to many of my colleagues in states that do total vote by mail, and they're very dependent on the Postal Service to do all the delivery. And if they don't, then people start showing up back at the polls again because they didn't get them in in time or whatever the issue is. So there's a lot of sort of structural issues. What has hit me through all this is the desperate need for more technology, just basic technology in elections. For example, we don't even have an electronic way to deliver 
to get applications electronically and send them in electronically. That's so basic in today's society, but we just have never developed that, that system to do that. Uh, we don't have rudimentary co copying equipment, you know, fast, fast uh, copiers that can do things. And largely in Connecticut, it's because everything is so hyper-local that it's hard to imagine buying a fancy, you know, high-speed scanner for 169 little towns, some of which have 2,000 people. So there's a lot of structural issues that I think new technology could really help. And I'm not talking about voting online or any of that, because I still am convinced it is not secure. Uh, and security, we haven't talked about security, but overlaying on all this are our concerns about security, which have not gone away. So we're still working on that, trying to make sure that the connectivity is there in all these towns. We're using the National Guard to go out and try to help with some of that. Um, but that has really come to me through this because even the legislative leaders are saying to us, well, let's just do it electronically. Um, we have issues with petitioning the candidates, third party candidates who can't go door to door to get petitions right now. So how are we gonna manage that? And we've had to come up with a whole structure that isn't frankly very satisfying uh, because it's very difficult to overcome that. Well, if we had an electronic signature matching system as they do in many vote by mail states to check the signatures electronically, that would be another technology that would be extremely useful. So I, I see there's so much room for this and it is expensive, but the United States just has to invest in this because at least we should be at least as good as the private sector in a lot of this, and because that's what the public does expect. Well, I, I certainly agree with uh, my colleague. We, we looked at with an increased need for absentee balloting. Um, one of the questions I asked is, well, um, if we go up considerably in the percentage of, of paper ballots, what are we, how are we going to counteract um, issues uh, or perceived issues of fraud uh, through signature comparisons? Because right now it's done uh, by naked eye as they come in, um, the registrar or voters checks them. If they have a question, they put them in a challenge pile and the challenges are dealt with by the local board. Um, and the, I was told that we don't even have on file, even though we have voter signatures on file, they're not at high enough resolution for um, electronic comparison. Um, so I would have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and ask for a complete download of the, the signatures that they have on file so that I would have a high resolution. Well, that creates a whole nother bureaucratic issue that we would have to deal with um, and cost. Um, and while that money could be used for it, the problem is, is that the timing isn't there. Um, when we finish this um, election cycle uh, this summer, we're immediately into the presidential and we don't have time to take, take a break or take a breath um, because we will be behind the eight ball um, we'll, as it is with the Republican convention being when it is, I'm having to have a special um, amendment to the law to allow for them to qualify the electors for the November election, um, which means as soon as that's done, then we've got to get, we got to meet the 45 day uh, requirement for UOCAVA. And um, it's, it's all very difficult. And um, the expectations from the locals, the need from the locals, uh, I just had to replace um, uh, equipment in all of the locals offices in order to meet cybersecurity standards that we, we have to have. Um, so I spent that money out of my budget uh, and uh, with an anticipation and hope that we were going to have additional monies coming from the state um, because we had a surplus for the first time forever. Well, now we went from a $500 million surplus, now we're facing a billion dollar deficit for next fiscal year. Um, or debt actually, um, because we're spending money we don't have. So that's got to come from somewhere. Um, it is just amazing to me um, the um, assumptions that are made. Um, and I, I think Denise can, can probably um, agree with me on this. Even elected officials who work with us on a regular basis truly don't understand what it means to put on an election and they've been through the process themselves. And they don't understand the background of it and the requirements of it um, and, and all the timing of it. And they just think we can wave a magic wand and, and fix things. And it's like, 
that's not how this operates. Um, and you certainly can't turn on a dime the procedures that you've built up, uh, which is what I've been, you know, telling our members of Congress. I get the focus on making legislative changes uh, and, and the, the need for thinking differently in the future, but you cannot change years and years of procedures like that. It just doesn't work that way. And because that requires training and you can't even do training like you used to do training. You now have got to do virtual training and, and the commissioners aren't going to get the training they truly need. So that means there's going to be a lot more questions, a lot more issues or requirements of staff at each polling location. And I don't know about Denise, but I've got over 3,900 polling locations wow. that we have commissioners at, and I've got to have staff available to get to the machines to, to fix them or answer any questions. And I fully expect our hotline to be overloaded. It was overloaded when we were putting out the, the emergency plan. It wasn't good enough for the liberals. I didn't go far enough. And I went too far with the Republicans and nobody was in the middle except me being roadkill. I mean, that's just the way <laughs> we operated. Um, but there's just, there's a lot out there and people just don't understand this is not flip of a light switch on and off and, and we can make adjustments with more light bulbs or less. It just doesn't work that way. So Kyle, I got one follow-up question for you because I guess that's my concern is that voters will wait too late in the process with an absentee or mail process if they've never done it before and don't have any experience. And then now we'll overwhelm. Some of them may not get their ballot back in time. There may be, um, Office is overwhelmed with the not expecting it. How do we, how do, maybe it's public education, but how do we get voters to, if they're going to use absentee, to start that process earlier and um, get it into the office at a reasonable time before election day? Well, one of the things that we did in our emergency plan is um, because we simply delayed the election, uh, we made no other requirement to have to get a new ballot. So anyone who had already returned their ballot, it's a valid ballot for this election. Um, so we've got a decent number of folks who have already participated. That's going to help. Um, but I'm not sure how that's going to uh, really play into it when we have a larger percentage of folks requesting under normal conditions, um, not the emergency conditions, just absentee ballots. Um, one of the things I'm going to use some of the care dollars for is through the Postal Service to track the ballots. Uh, but again, I have very high concerns about utilizing the Postal Service um, because of all this, the press reports of their, they found ballots still at the Postal uh, Service um, for the Wisconsin election. It's like, how can I assure voters that their vote's going to get in? So what we did was we are, uh, we have currently have a process by which uh, a family member can drop off um, a ballot to the registrar's office in person. If they bring more than one, they've got to fill out a form as to who it is and what their relationship is to that individual. Um, and we're going to continue that in this emergency plan. Um, I'm also got legislation that's uh, moving pretty fast through the process um, to prevent um, what we would all refer to as ballot harvesting or absentee uh, request harvesting. Um, and that is legislation to require um, that only one person can be a witness uh, on a ballot. Um, and if it's more than one, it's gotta be a family member um, and also for the request. Um, so, I mean, we're taking necessary precautions um, and all of that requires uh, more money. Um, but I think that that's the necessary requirements in order to assure voters that um, their election is going to be uh, appropriate. Then I need to use money. I, I agree with Denise. This is probably the time where we need more money uh, than ever before in order to educate voters of what, what the importance is of how you fill out an absentee request um, and the legalities or the penalties for forging one um, so that you prevent uh, a fraudulent activity, uh, but also how do you get it back? and when the timing that you have to, because I, I totally agree with you. I mean, our deadline for requesting one is 72 hours prior to the election, but 4.30 p.m., three days before the election. Uh, but the, the, the requirement to return it is it's got to be in 4.30 p.m. the day before the election or it can't be counted. Um, so I do worry about a number of ballots coming in 
uh, after the deadline and not being able to be counted. Commissioner McCormick, I'll let you, I'll let you go now. Yeah, so we have uh, one last question and, uh, you know, Kyle, I think you've got 64 parishes uh, in Louisiana and Secretary Merrill, you mentioned 169 towns. Uh, multiply that by 54 more states and territories across the country. We've got a lot of election jurisdictions uh, and a lot of election officials. So um, what advice would you give to other election officials to help best prepare for concerns surrounding COVID-19 with regard to administering elections? Well, I would say start as soon as possible and engage your local people immediately because they're going to have all the questions and they are the ones that are going to help you communicate it to the public. So you've got to get them on board early and you have to be clear with them that what you're doing is trying to bring resources to them to help them with what they very well regard as a big problem because it's the uncertainty of all this. Yeah. What we were just talking about, for example, how do we know that people will start early enough to get their absentee ballots in? And then when they realize they're not in in time, are they all gonna show up at the polling place? You know, that happened in Wisconsin. Yeah. That's why I say it was really an aha moment for a lot of us. So that, that's the key as usual is planning. And I think um, engaging those local folks as much as you can. But certainly, uh, I think a good use of all these dollars we have is trying to make our polling places safe. That's going to require a lot of resources. And that is what the local people are most worried about, in my view. Uh, they are worried they won't have poll workers. They're worried they won't have protection, that the voters won't be required to come in with masks on. It's very similar to these uh, grocery store search situations. And right. we're taking the grocery stores as a model, honestly, as how they've done social distancing. You know, you have to stand outside. I don't know if this is true everywhere, but here you have to stand outside six feet apart. They let a certain number in. They have someone there guiding all this. Uh, you know, aisles only go one way. So a lot of that is just good planning, like always. So I'm glad we started early. I'm glad we postponed our primary for sure. And I'm gonna start sending out applications for absentee ballots probably next week for a primary in August, just to make sure, because that's gonna make people realize, oh, I have to think about this and it will have instructions on there. So uh, I would say early, early yeah, and the Timelines are important, aren't they? Yes, yes, hugely. Secretary Arduin, what about you? What advice would you give to other election officials? My, my first set of advice would be uh, take a deep breath, um, and ask your staff questions. Um, be inquisitive about it and don't be afraid to, um, to question everything. Uh, I think one of the things that I learned out of frustration is because we knew we were going to have to increase the participation by mail and because our state was in such flux, um, because of the uh, amount of cases uh, and the deaths were rack racking up, uh, higher than what Katrina uh, delivered upon um, New Orleans. Um, it was becoming such a hot potato issue. Um, what, we, what we really realized was that because we needed equipment, and this, was, this, this is what really drove us to react so quickly, is we needed, we had to get the equipment and we had to get the supplies um, for secure balloting uh, for paper. Um, which required us to react sooner than we probably uh, wanted to, uh, which sort of created some of the hysteria that we had to deal with um, because we were meeting deadlines um, for our vendors um, because they weren't sure. I, I, well, what played into it was all the states, I think, it, so Wisconsin, um, Nevada, um, Arizona, um, Kentucky, um, and um, uh, Ohio um, and Pennsylvania, I believe, uh, and New Jersey and New York. So all these states are competing and many of them much larger than the, uh, with much larger populations than Louisiana, needing new equipment or additional equipment, which caused us to meet an artificial deadline that we normally would not have had to meet, which sped things up because we had to get our order in in order to be able to get it delivered in time um, for it. Um, so, you know, 
I, I think that what my advice is, understand the deadlines that you're facing. Understand that the public is not going to, under, uh, to, to realize what it is that you have to do uh, in a timeline that they don't understand. Uh, and then figure out a way to make sure that you're managing the, the press as much as possible and educating voters ahead of time as you're making these decisions. Because I don't know what November is going to bring for all of us, but certainly the issue is, is that transparency is the most important part of elections. And the sooner you can get the information out to voters, the better, because there's more, there'll be more understanding versus everything getting thrown into the Washington hype um, which caused us a lot of uh, uh, angst in the process. Um, but so I had to take a lot of deep breaths. Uh, I'm still dealing with a lot of issues in my back <laughs> because of the, the stress. Uh, I'm actually even going to physical therapy uh, weekly because it's just been, it's been larger than anything I've dealt with um, in my life other than family issues. And, you know, um, it, it's just a lot of pressure on a lot of people uh, and, I think that folks need to really just kind of think things through as well as they can and then act as um, expeditiously and appropriately that they can and then stick to the plan and move forward. And eventually everybody's going to see it through and that they'll realize that you had done the right thing because you knew what to do. I don't think, you know, one of the things that we as election officials have to realize, regardless of our political affiliations, um, we have to make sure that every citizen who is eligible gets the opportunity to express themselves um, through the vote. And the, the fact is, is that that's a solemn um, promise that we make when we take our oaths. And sometimes our own people in our political parties don't necessarily understand that. And they expect us to act political when we really can't act political. Um, and so to, to, to my, my advice to my colleagues all around the, the country, whether it be a small location or a large state operation, is that we have a solemn obligation to bring democracy to the people of our, that we represent. And that's the most important thing that we could ever do. And we have to do it in a nonpartisan way. That's a great point. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of stress for a lot of election officials everywhere. And uh, I just want to thank uh, you and Secretary Merrill for all the hard work you both are putting in. We. We are mentioning how we're all working harder than we've ever worked before on these issues. Uh, hard to believe, but people are working around the clock trying to figure all of this out. So we want to thank you. We want to thank the election officials across the country who are expending a lot of time and energy on this and under a lot of stress. Uh, so take care of yourselves <laughs> uh, it, while you're trying while you're trying to figure this out. And um, well, thank you very much. And I want to tell you and Don and uh, Ben and um, uh, Ted, that we are very appreciative to the work that your staff does and the resources that your staff provides us. I think uh, if ever uh, there was a, a time to, to not question the role of the EAC and to thank you all for the role that you're playing as advocates for us all across this country, now is that time. And I, I'm, I'm thankful that no one was successful in getting rid of the EAC and that you all are there for us. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Denise feels the same way. I mean, uh, you know, we just utilized some of your staff uh, two hours ago uh, with some questions that we had with some of the equipment that we're looking at. So thank you all for the, the role that you play and y'all are a bipartisan voice for um, election officials across this country. And that's what we need in Washington more than ever. Well, we're here to serve. So thank you for that. And I say thank amen. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Secretary Merrill. Commissioner Palmer, do you want to finish up? Well, thank you. We, we value our relationships uh, with the secretaries, particularly uh, sure. Secretary Ardoin and Secretary Merrill, and we wish you the best of luck in your primaries and then on to the general election. If there's anything we can do here at the AC, again, we know you pick, pick up the phone and call us at any time and we'll always be advocates for you. Thank you. And with that, thank, thank you for participating you. in this Zoom interview. Thank okay. you. Thanks. God bless everyone. You Stay too. safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.